EK-43 as we know it today was actually launched in 19... Hi! Hi, thank you for walking into my shot. I was just thinking what we really need, what we really need is someone farting. A full 19 years before its potential for high yield espresso was discovered and commercially real... Oh, the masks do nothing! I'm Dave Miller. I make hot rods in my garage. Except the hot rods make coffee. And they fit through doorways. And the garage is my house. And sometimes my living room. Alright, Patreon supporters, real talk. I love you, but you gotta cool it with the 3 a.m. Candy Crush requests, okay? Time zones. Also, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Your gold membership gives you access to all deleted scenes and outtakes. That's right. All the junk that isn't good enough for regular content is all yours. All you gotta do is pay money. Makes perfect sense. I mean, where do you think all that extra footage ends up? In the garbage? <laughs> so, let me ask you this. How many coffee professionals do you think have looked over at their EK-43 sitting on the counter and asked themselves, where did this grinder come from? I certainly have. I don't mean when it was discovered or by whom or for what reason, we all know that. But I mean before it was famous. There's almost no historical information on the EK-43 published anywhere. So this time on Legends, we're gonna get into that. I had a really interesting conversation with Christian Klott the other day from Liston Bichler. And what he's told me about this grinder is gonna knock you right off your chop. So what does EK-43 mean? Let's break down the model code system. The EK-43 belongs to a family of grinders that's been around since the late 1970s. But the model we know today was actually introduced in 1990. Each position in the key indicates a different sub-configuration, like phase type, feed product, and motor design. For instance, the EK-43 and most commercial grinders are only available for single-phase current, or Einphasenstrom. But industrial grinders like the DK-27 units are Dreifasenstrom, or three-phase current. The K code is for coffee, of course, but different burr blades and sometimes carrier impellers are necessary to grind different feed products, and each one is given a code letter corresponding with its German name. The last code is the generation of motor design. Before 43, there was 23 and 48, which was larger, but of course the DK27 is gigantic. So it just refers to a design type. Sometimes there's a revision that doesn't warrant a series change, like L, S, L, E, etc. And they just tack those onto the end. Getting back to this nugget, the 48 was the largest and most desirable variant of the 23 uprights until sometime in the 1980s when Zwanger was acquired by Malkinig and this unit was replaced by this, I mean this grinder, the VTA-6. I gotta stop making that joke. I'm making it while I'm being serious. All right, what do you suppose would actually happen to R2-D2 if somebody poured coffee beans into it? Okay, it's out of my system. You see a whole team of psychiatrists, aren't you? Okay, so I was checking my analytics, and my last YouTube video got six whole views from South Africa. Worldwide, baby! I know a guy in South Africa. His name is Donovan. Rock on, Donovan. Hope you like my next video. South Africa kicks ass. God, I didn't spill these. EM48 update. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this because uh, I've got some customers' machines to get back to. I can already hear some of you guys on the other side of the screen saying, why the hell aren't you working on my machine? And the answer is, well, because I'd go mad. You can see that alignment of the burr blades would be pretty straight ahead, like it basically take the micrometer, put it here, give it a spin but it's not the super accurate version. We don't want to get too cute with this because the um, pre-brake housing sits over top of this aluminum thingy here. I probably should have taken a before picture because popping those little whiskey dents out was, uh, it took a lot of patience. It's really, really thin stuff and we'll never really get the rash off of it, but at least 
it's back in the same shape it was. Another interesting thing is this impeller, you might be wondering how to get it off, and I was wondering for about 10 seconds, but there's a little, you can see that little hole in there. That's so you can stick a screwdriver in and kind of twist this off. You know, so you can check the alignment, but to correct it, you really should send the whole armature out to get the whole thing spun up because, you know, if you do this by itself, I mean, how do you chuck that on the lathe when it's got a threaded hole, right? And, uh, you know, the, the motor shaft itself might introduce the little wobble that you want to correct on the lathe. So do the whole thing at once. And I got to replace the bushings on it because, well, holy crap, they're pretty noisy. I'm just going to plug this in here so you can kind of hear it. Yeah, that's pretty loud. So one bearing up here, another one down there, and they're just a regular bearing, like a 6205 or something like that. Not a challenge. Anyway, this thing's been really fun. Um, so I'm gonna put some new bearings in, uh, and that's probably as far as I'll ever go with it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Another fun fact for you. These poppy seed burr blades, as you can see, have the finishing teeth ground in the opposite direction. And the reason for that is because of the way ground poppy seed behaves is that they have to be crushed during the finishing stage, otherwise they'll clog the blades up. So this isn't actually a manufacturing mistake, this is the way they're supposed to look. You'll see as well that the stationary blade originally started life in the nose cone, and this is the design that goes back to before the Second World War, when Zwanger was selling these machines as original favorite. It wasn't until the platform was redesigned for the EK-43 in 1990 that the position of the stationary and rotating burrs were reversed, as you can see. Um, why would they do that? So that they could install this right here. This is the, called the shear plate, and it's a soft piece of metal that's designed to break in the event that a screw or a stone or other foreign object enters the grind chamber so that the motor shaft doesn't get damaged. So there you have it. From the original Zwanger, original favorite design that all but disappeared off the face of the planet before anyone even noticed, to the EK-43, which spent a full 19 years in obscurity before they were discovered and now it's hard to imagine a specialty coffee shop without one. As a matter of fact, a lot of them even have two or more of them. But here's a fun fact that Christian Klatt wanted personally for me to pass on to you, is that in 2010, this grinder almost became extinct. That's right, they were considering discontinuing this model and placed it under review for a two-year sales study. And it was just blind coincidence that it was around that same time that Scott Rayo, Matt Perger, and Benjamin Kaminsky were all talking about its potential for high yield espresso around 2009, 2011, and of course everybody remembers Matt Perger's World Barista Championship routine that propelled this EK-43 to stardom. Fast forward to today, when production numbers of the EK-43 have increased over the 2010 figures by a factor of over 40 times. That's one hell of a turnaround story. That's it, that's all I got for this video. There's a lot more to know about the EK-43, but you don't need me for that. There's plenty of other videos and all sorts of articles have been written about these since then. But this is a story that really needed to be told. But wait a minute, you didn't think I'd let you go without taking this for a spin, did you? Alright, let's see how this old girl stands up to modern methods. Y'all knew this was coming. Champagne of victory, coffee family. Cheers.